My wife asked me, do, do you feel uh, like it's your birthday when you have to work? Um, uh, no, this is, uh, but this is a great evening, ain't it? Oh, hi. And, uh, and the post office as well. And we have been instructed to deliver you this postcard and wish you a happy birthday. <laughs> I guess they hacked my uh, phone. Now I, I told them because I brought some cake to my fellow Heralds because it's my birthday. So uh, thank you, Heralds. Thank you, Post Office. Wow, it's so wonderful that these services are around. A big applause for the Post Office. <laughs> and then for the, for the thing you're really here for, of course, which is the great talk. <laughs> So we've wor I've warmed up the audience with, together with the, the main, the most office uh, warmed up the audience for you a bit already. Um, now, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we're going to start with uh, our next speaker. I won't tell him about him that much because he will do, introduce him himself, but let's give him at least as warm a welcome as you gave me. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Matthijs Melissen. <laughs> Hi, good evening all. Good evening all. I'm going to talk tonight about single sign-on protocols as seen from the perspective of a hacker. First, a little bit of, about myself. I'm Matthijs Melissen, and I started my career a long, long time ago as a developer, PhD developer in a small software company. After that, I moved into academia. I started working as a researcher at the University of Birmingham and the University of Luxembourg. I did research on single sign-on protocols there, and currently I'm working as a hacker. I've been working for more than seven years at Computest now, a security testing company in the Netherlands. You might have seen our tents already. It's the tent at the very end of the field with all the arcade games inside there. If you haven't, feel free to drop by. So Computest is a full-service security company. I myself work as a security tester, but we also do incident response. We do monitoring and we do governance services. And that's briefly about me. So, single sign-on, that's what I'm going to talk about tonight. What is actually single sign-on? I guess many of you have logged into the Stack Exchange website sometime, and I'm going to demonstrate how single sign-on looks like from an end-user perspective um, on the Stack Exchange site. So if you want to look, log into Stack Exchange, you're clicking at this beautiful login button there. You're presented with a next screen in which you can choose between a couple of single sign-on providers. You can choose, in this case, Google, Facebook, or Yahoo, you can also choose the own Stack Exchange single sign-on provider. For example, when you click on Google, you're forwarded to Google. You can also see in the URL bar that we are at the google.com domain now. You enter your Google credentials, and Google provides back the user's identity to Stack Exchange. And we are logged in at Stack Exchange now. So that's briefly what single sign-on looks like. I already mentioned a single sign-on provider can also be a website that's run by the application itself, by the company itself, and that's a trend that we really have seen a lot in the last couple of years, that instead of building one gigantic application containing an authentication module, what companies are doing is they're moving authentication out of their application towards a single, to, to a single identity provider or a single sign-on provider, and um, which is good because it means that you don't need to worry about authentication within your application any anymore. So why would people move towards single sign-on? There's a couple of advantages and, of course, also a couple of disadvantages. First of all, single sign-on makes it quite easy to use for the user. You can log into a lot of different applications using the same credentials, so you don't need to create different credentials for each application or store different credentials for each application in your password manager. It is also quite easy from the perspective of the, of the person managing the web application. Because what you can do is 
there's only one single place, only in the identity provider, where you're storing users' identities. So if you're running multiple websites, there's a single place where you can manage them all. And a final advantage is security, with a big question mark behind it, of course. It's somehow nice, from a security point of view, to have an um, identity provider handling all your authentication. But, um, and the reason that is nice is that that means that all the difficulties of authentication and logging in, you only need to handle at one place. But of course, every advantage comes also with its own downside, and that means that you need to build some kind of protocol that connects the application to the identity prov provider. And in particular, you need to have something on the side of the application that handles the response of the identity provider. And what we are seeing as, a, as security testers in my daily life, I see this going wrong a lot of times. And the problem is, if it goes wrong, you have immediately serious consequences, because it immediately means that you can log in to the application. Um, so an attacker can immediately log in to the application if there's a mistake there without having the right credentials. So what would be the simplest possible solution to solve this problem. And I think that's this very simple protocol. What we're doing is we're entering as a user a username and password towards the service provider. That's the application we would like to log into. We have a username and password that is forwarded by the service provider to the identity provider. The identity provider checks if these credentials are right, and if so, tells the service provider. Very simple protocol, also a perfectly good protocol. As long as you are OK with the fact that um, it's a perfect, perfectly fine protocol as long as you assume that service providers are trustworthy. If you build a setup like this, if one of the service providers gets compromised or gets malicious, they own the credentials of the user, so they can also log in to all the applications that are connected to the same identity provider. In reality, often in security, you would like to have segregation. So you would like to have the guarantee that even if your service provider gets compromised, all other service providers remain secure. And this is the reason that you would like to have single sign-on, and that you would like to have a proper single sign-on protocol rather than the simple naive solution that I gave here. So what are we going to talk, to about, uh, talk about tonight? I'm going to talk about two protocols, the two protocols that we see the most in the wild, SAML, which is an XML-based protocol, and OAuth and OpenID Connect. I'll tell about the relation between these two later. And for each of those protocols, first I'm going to show how it works, and then I'm going to show what are the most common attacks. I'm not going to demonstrate any new attacks today. Today's attacks that I'm going to present are all attacks that are very well known by the people that look into these protocols every day, but apparently not so well known by developers. So we can find these attacks quite commonly in the wild. Like I said, I would start with SAML. And in SAML, we have three different roles. We have a service provider, that's the application that the user would like to log into, and we have an identity, identity provider. That's the server or the service that checks the user's identity. And of course, we have a user that tries to log in through his browser. And the steps of the protocol are actually quite simple. The service provider, if the user wants to log in, then the service provider sends an authentication request through the user's browser to the identity provider. Note that all messages are passed through the user's browser. The identity provider then checks the user's identity and sends an authentication response back to the service provider. And if the service provider receives that, receives that authentication response, then the service provider can check that it indeed is the right user that's logged in. So I'm going to show now how these messages look like. An authentication request like I said, it's XML-based, so an, XML, an authentication request looks like this. We have in there an ID, we have the name of the provider, the destination, and we have also, here we have the issuer, which is the service provider that generates the request. 
If the identity provider receives this message, then it responds with a SAML response. In the SAML response is an ID. Again, there is a destination, and there is an in response to value here that should be equal to the ID of the request that we just saw. Also, there's the name of the issuer, the name of the identity provider. There's a status code, success in this case, which means that logging in succeeded, and there is an assertion. And the assertion looks like this. It again has an ID, it has the name of the issuer. It does have a digital signature. And this is, by the way, funny because digital signatures contain a URI that refers to the part that's actually being signed. So in this case, it says this URI is being signed. So the entire thing that's signed contains its own signature, which when I first thought it, this is funny, you cannot put a signature over something that contains that same signature, but actually the protocol takes this into account. So it first drops the signature before actually verifying the signature. Moreover, what we have is a subject, that's the name of the, or the ID of the user that's trying to log in. We have um, conditions, for example, for which audience is it meant and when is it valid. We have an authentication statement, when was authentication happening. And this is important, we have the attribute value, which contains, in this case, the email address of the user that's trying to log in. Can also be other, there can also be other attributes. These messages, of course, need to be um, sent to the other side somehow, and there's two different ways to do that. There are URL bindings and there are post bindings. What we do, we take the message, we take the XML, we deflate it, that's a compression algorithm, we base64 it, we URL encode it, and pass it in the URL. Or we can do exactly the same thing, but in a hidden form field. So, what, can, what kind of things can possibly go wrong here? First of all, what we can try to do as hackers, Execute the man-in-the-middle attack. Try to get in between the service provider and the identity provider, intercept the messages, and see if you can do something like that. And actually, in this case where we use HTTP, there's nothing that prevents us from doing that. SAML doesn't care about transport level security. SAML doesn't encrypt any messages that are sent from one side to the other. It does have signatures, but those signatures don't um, guarantee confidentiality, only integrity. So. If there is no TLS, we can intercept all messages, including the SAML response, and use that SAML response to log in to the user that's trying to log in. So always, always, always run SAML protocols over TLS. Fortunately, most of the implementations that we see actually do this nowadays. What else can we do? I already showed you before that there is a signature in these XML messages. Of course, if there is a signature, we want to break that. And this is something that actually works surprisingly often we see at our customers. We surprisingly often see that there is a nice signature in the message, but there is no process on the other side that actually verifies this signature. And my theory why this happens so often is that developers mainly care about making things work, and there is nothing that doesn't work if they write an implementation that doesn't check the signature. Other theory I have is that perhaps they might comment out the line that checks the signature at some point, then don't notice that, they, or then for, they forget that they ever commented this out and then forget to uncomment this. Anyway, I don't, these are two hypotheses about what are the reasons, but we do see that signature checks are very often just ignored. In addition to checking signatures, what we can also do is check if unsigned messages are accepted. And that's not exactly the same, right? So in if you check if the signature is verified, we just change the message, see if it's still accepted. What we can also do is just drop the entire signature, drop the entire thing from the XML, and see if the application likes it. What we also can do is self-signed certificates. These signatures are actually signed by a certificate. We can check, and we can check if the message is encrypted rather than signed, because for some reason, developers also confuse these two quite often. My third attack that I'm going to discuss is also a quite fun one. It's XML signature wrapping, and it's based on the way, uh, based on a parser differential between getting the ID that's trying to log in and verifying the signature. And what I'm 
mean with that is I'm going to show this in this quite complicated XML overview. So on the left is the regular message. On the right is the message that we are using if we are going to attack this. What we are doing is we are wrapping the entire thing into our own SAML response with an evil response ID. It doesn't really matter what it is. We are changing that, so we are entering here the ID of the user that we would like to log into. And we are um, changing the signature. So we are, what we are doing is this, or we are actually not changing the signature, so what we are doing is this signature refers to the green blob. The signature is still valid. And what we see in some implementations, and this is also something we actually do see in practice, what we see in some implementations is that um, the, if you send a message like this that the part that is verified, that's the green part, and the green part has a perfectly fine signature, and then there is a next step in which we are going to check which user is actually trying to log in. To do that, we still take the outermost SAML assertion, we check which ID that is, but that is not the idea of which we just check the signature. So this is XML signature wrapping. Attack number four, attacking the XML parser. And many hackers that have ever worked with XML will find this familiar. There's a lot of nasty things you can do in XML. For example, you can define your own external XML entities that might refer to internal files, that might refer to internal network locations, and you can use this to, um, to read the content of the network location or read the content of the local file. Nothing special about that, just the normal XML of, um, vulnerabilities that always work, also sometimes work here. Then we have login cross-site request forgery. And I hear many of you thinking, OK, login cross-site request for you is not actually so serious. But I'll show you that in the case of SAML, this can be really nasty. Because we have, um, let me first quickly repeat what login cross-site request for means normally, is you can do cross-site request for against the login functionality, which means that as an attacker, we can log in ourselves on the device of a user. So that means that the user opens his laptop, Cross-site request forgery happens, and the user finds that the attacker is logged in on the application on his device. Or perhaps he might not find it, he might not spot it, and he might um, accidentally enter data in the application, not knowing that he is entering the data to the attacker accounts. So again, what we can do, we can log in ourselves as the attacker on the user's device, not the other way around. That would be much more serious, of course. But the nice thing, and I mean from a hacker perspective, what we can do is we can also connect our Facebook account. Um, many applications have functionality that let you add an existing account, an existing single sign-on account like Facebook to your account. And by pressing add Facebook account, it's running through the normal login flow, the normal SAML flow, but instead of logging in, it connects your Facebook account to your existing account. And if you can CSRF this, what that means is we can connect the attacker's Facebook account to a user's account, which means that in the future we can always use our attacker's Facebook to log in to the account of the user. So login CSRF can be very serious, and it's something, especially if you have connecting functionality, that needs to be taken very seriously. How does it actually work? Basically the same as um, CSRF, login CSRF always works. So what do we do? As an attacker, we connect to the service provider. We say we want to log in onto our own account. The authentication request gets forwarded to the identity provider. We log in with our own account, with our own attacker credentials. And now we have an authentication response that belongs to our account. And then we forward this authentication response to the user agent. It might be, for example, the user. It might be, for example, a link in which the user agent or the user can click. If the user agent is tricked into clicking on that link, then this link will be followed in the user's browser. It's going to go to the service provider, where the user is going to receive a valid session for the attacker. How do you actually fix this? It's very simple, because there, 
is a default way of fixing this into um, in SAML, and this is something I just explained. I quickly mentioned it because we have this we have this in response to value here. And the in response to value I already mentioned needs to match the ID. And this is, might be something that looks a bit as a familiar pattern. Maybe some of you guessed this already, but yes, this in response to val pattern is actually just a simple normal CSRF token. It functions exactly the same. So the trick is on the side, yeah, you know, the, the trick is we, on the side of the service provider, we need to save this ID in the user session, and we need to check if the in response to value comes back that this indeed matches the ID that we sent out earlier. Then the last attack for SAML that I would like to discuss is being a malicious service provider. And this is something that I started this talk from. The reason we use such complicated protocols is because we want to, get, we want to protect ourselves against service providers that get compromised. So then, of course, the question is, does SAML actually protect against this? Do we have the guarantee that if one service provider gets compromised, that all the other ones are still secure? Fortunately, we should have this guarantee if the implementation is correct. So what is going on? We can try to attack this. We can start a session as a malicious service provider with the service provider. So we just let ourselves log in. We get an authentication request. As a malicious service provider, then we're going to start a session with the user. So we have just a normal flow authentication request to the identity provider and authentication response back to the malicious service provider. And um, now we have an authentication response that's meant for us, for our service provider. What we can do is try to forward that authentication response meant for us to another service provider and see what happens. And I can tell you, most of the time this is not going to work, because remember, this authentication response contains the name of the service provider, the service provider is probably going to check what name is in there. This check might be forgotten. I think Google did this, forget this forgot this check sometime in the very early days of SAML. Um, so that way, there was a serious vulnerability at Google. Anyway, um, probably the service provider is going to check the um, authentication response and the name of the service provider in there, and we'll see that this message is not intended for him. We can always try if it works, because who knows, maybe we forgot about this check. So that's the summary of the first half of this part, first half of this talk. Um, some of vulnerabilities, what we saw is you can try executing man in the middle attacks, you can try to bypass a signature check, you can try to do XML signature wrapping, X attack the XML parser, log in CSRF, and you can try to be a malicious service provider. These are six of the most common or most interesting attacks. Of course, there are a few others, but these are the most interesting to present, I think. Let's continue with OAuth. If I'm in a smaller group, I always ask people, do you guys know what OAuth stands for? And people always respond, yes, of course I know this. It stands for open authentication. Everyone says it, wrong. It stands for authorization. And why I mention this is, this is actually important. Because um, the purpose of OAuth is not to be an authentication algorithm or an authentication protocol. The purpose of OAuth is to allow an application to access research resources of another user on behalf of a user. So for example, we can OAuth, we can use OAuth to allow an other application to access our profile page. Let's have a look how it looks like. It's not XML based this time, so all messages are a lot shorter. They even fit all on one slide instead of the five slides I used, I didn't need it for SAML. So what's going on? We start, we have four calls in total, a user author authorization request and an authorization code grant. These are passed through the user agents. And we have then a backend call that's not passed through the user agent, but straight server to server, an access token request, and an access token grant. So these are the backend server to server calls. First, probably I should mention what roles we have in OAuth. 
because they basically roughly function the same as SAML roles, but of course they use different vocabulary. So what we have in OAuth is we have a client, that's the application that would like to get access to a resource, to a resource like the user's profile, and we have an authorization server, that's the server that checks the user's identity. We start with a user authorization request, and in the user authorization request, we send a message straight away to the auth server with the request for a code, an authorization code. Um, and in that request, we also include a redirect URI, that's written here, client.com slash callback, which is the URI that the message is being sent back to. So what the authorization server is going to do now, like it should, is going to check the user's identity, and it's going to check if the user actually authorizes the client to get access to, the, for example, the profile data. So in an most OAuth flows, you always see such a check. Then if that check is passed, then it's going to send indeed a message back to the redirect URI that we passed, including this code. And this code is an authorization code, which gives the client permission to continue the rest of the flow, which is the, which is the server, to server to server call, client to authorization server, containing the access token request. And how that looks like is we are passing the name of the client ID, the name of the client secret, and we are passing the code that we just received. And the, service, the server is going to respond to that with a piece of JSON that contains an access token. And the access token is something that can be used, for example, to call an API that contains the profile information. So you, as you see here, we have a two-step process here. First, we are passing an authorization, or first, we are, yeah, first we are passing an authorization code, and this authorization code can be exchanged for an, for an access token. Let's continue to the attacks. First attack, be a malicious client. And I already mentioned earlier in the SAML case, SAML protects against this by default. So of course, OAuth is going to protect against this as well, right? No, wrong. There is no protection whatsoever present in OAuth against malicious clients. OAuth doesn't offer any protection against clients that forward the token to other clients. And that's actually by design. Because like I started, OAuth is not an authentication protocol, OAuth is an authorization protocol. You can, for example, authorize a user to share his profile. And if you authorize to that to one client, it wouldn't be weird for that client to also pass that authorization on to other applications. After all, they could also directly share the content of the um, the content of the profile. So important to remember in OAuth, no pre no protection whatsoever against clients that forward tokens. Um, so there is a solution for that, fortunately, and that solution is OpenID Connect. So OpenID Connect is a small extension built on top of OAuth and JWT, JSON Web Tokens. And it looks like this, and it's actually a very simple extension to OAuth, because what we have here is we have here an ID token. This one is added to the access token grant, and this is actually JWT. So this is a signed um, message generated by the authorization server that contains importantly, the audience. And what I mean with the audience is the client that the message is being used for. It also contains some other information, including the user's identity. And because we're adding the audience now, the audience is sent to the, or the message is sent to the client, and the client cannot longer forward it, or of course he can try to forward it, but a good client would check that he's not the audience and reject the message. Of course, as a security specialist, something we should always still check for if this check actually happens. But OpenID Connect is intended to be used for, author for authentication. So, um, 
something I already briefly showed you is that if you have an OAuth flow, there should normally be a screen in which actually authorize the application to get um, access to certain data or to log in. Some applications or some flows skip that step, which is nice for us as security testers or as hackers, because it means that we can make any client have the user log into us and obtain the identity of any clients. Sorry, as a client, we can as a client we can make any user log into us um, under some conditions, of course. Um, so therefore, we have this permission view. Something else, if they are so smart enough to actually have this check, don't give up yet. There's something we can do. We can try to do CSRF on this button and see if that works, because that's also fun and accomplishes the same. Then, login, cross-site request forgery. This is something that we saw in SAML as well. Uh, we saw that SAML has protection against this. And open ID connect OAuth, it's the same in this case, also offers protection against this. It's also something that's implemented wrong incredibly often. We very often see that people just do not bother to actually implement this check, which is very nice, especially, again, if we have the functionality to connect new accounts to our accounts. So how does it work? The attacker goes to the authent authorization server, logs in with his own credentials, the authorization server responds with a code authorization code grant. Now we have a code grant for our account, and we pass that as a CSRF attack. We pass that authorization code grant link to the client. So we send the link to the client and hope that the client will click on that link. And then we are being used. We are logged in into the client, or yeah, we are logged in into the client. So the attacker is up at that point. Sorry, at that point the you. The user is logged in. Um, because it's just going to continue the same flow, access token request followed by an access token grant. Like I said, some has protection mechanisms against that. That's in response to value. OAuth also has protection against that. And that's done by means of a random state that's added to the user authorization request. So what's important is that the client, when it receives an authorization code grant, that it always verifies the state variable in that request with the, um, with the state that it stored in the session. Then, next attack. Redirect tokens back to us. In this case, we have um, a link, we have an we have an authorization server where we can log into. And remember, this one contains a redirect URI. Normally, this points back to the um, normally this points back to the clients. But we can also try to change this link and try to change this link so that it redirects to the attacker. So we can pass this to an um, we can pass this to the authorization server and hope that we actually re receive a redirect that redirects the code that we need to log in back to us as an attacker. You can even make it a bit more complicated. And that's what this guy actually did. This guy succeeded in um, attacking GitHub a couple of years back. And the way he did it was by path traversal. So he tried first to enter his own attacker domain into a redirect URI. That didn't work because there was a requirement that the redirect URI started with gist.github.com slash off slash github slash callback. What he did was he did pass traversal. He went up a couple of directories and then moved to his own home directory because we remember we had gist.github.com and at gist.github.com. You can place your own content. What happened was that the tokens were indeed redirected to his own home directory at github. So redirect URI is very tricky. Best way to implement that is probably make sure that you have the exact um, that you have the exact same string. Like you should probably define your own string, define one particular string that uh, that's the only string that's being accepted. Well, that would probably be the most secure way to accomplish this. 
then an extension, quite late, uh, a relatively new extension to OpenID Connect and OAuth is called Pixie. And what Pixie does is this is an extension that prevents leaked authorization codes from being useful. Why do we need that? Especially on mobile applications, we often see some problems. There's basically two problems with mobile applications. First of all, they don't have a backend, so they don't have a secure place to store their own client secrets. And second of all, redirecting back to a mobile application is very tricky. In many instances, it's possible to install your own mobile application as an attacker. So then there's a malicious application that registers the URL through which the user is being redirected. And then at that way, that way the attacker can intercept malicious codes. So that's the reason for Pixie. Make a way or design a way that prevents authorization codes from being useful. And what does it actually offer more precisely? Um, if there is a man in the middle attack on the authorization request, then we are still secure. You can prove that even if an attacker is able to read the authorization request, then um, there's still no attack possible. And the claim or the guarantee for the authorization code grant, so the response to that, is even stronger. An attacker that intercepts the code, or even an, an attacker that can modify the code, will still not be able to log in to the user's accounts. So what does Pixie look like? We start with generating a code verifier. That's just a random string. And we calculate the SHA-256 hash of that. And that will be the code challenge. And this code challenge we pass along with the user authorization request. And um, at the moment that, that we actually submit the access token request, we include the code verifier. And this code verifier, that's the original string, is also sent to the authorization server. The authorization server can now compare the two and can compare that, um, yeah, basically can check that this is indeed the SHA-256 uh, hash. So once again, the reason this is often done or sometimes done is this offers extra guarantee against authorization codes that get leaked. What can we do as a pen tester? If you see this, definitely check that this code verifier actually is checked. Because of course, I'm quite sure there will be many instances. I don't think I've ever spotted it in practice, but I'm quite sure there are many instances where people have forgotten about this check. So to summarize, again, a lot of different vulnerabilities in OpenID Connect. What can you do as an attacker? You can try to be a malicious client. You can try to bypass the permission of the user. You can try to execute login CSRF. You can try to redirect tokens back to SSD attacker using the redirect URI. You can check Pixie verification. So basically, the conclusion is single sign-on is very nice, because it really does provide a lot of advantages. But it is also very tricky to get right doesn't really matter if you use SAML or OpenID Connect. There's many small tricky things that if you forget to implement it cor correctly, you have big problems, such as the attacker being able to log in on the account of arbitrary users. So I think a general recommendation, this applies to a lot of security stuff in general, but I think to single sign-on protocols in particular, please do not build your own implementation. What we see at our customers if we see a vulnerability, we often have a little chat with the developer. Hey, what have you guys done? How come you actually implement, implemented this like this? And very often in that case, we see that they just build their own implementation with two or three lines that just check the necessary stuff, but don't actually check any security, um, or don't actually implement any of the security requirements. So please do not build this yourself. If you're going to use single sign-on, use an ex, use an, um, existing implementation, and both on the side of the identity provider. There's many good open source products out of there. I, I believe Keycloak is quite good. And also on the side of the application that actually receiving the uh, message that's coming from the single sign provider. Also on that side, 
Don't think it's just two lines of code. I do, can do this myself. Please use something that your library provides or uses some existing well-known framework. And finally, I think this is the most important, or this is one of the important things. Many, many developers don't know that the reason that you have single sign-on is that you want to protect against malicious clients. So in the entire process, keep in mind that the entire goal, the entire reason you're using protocols like that is that you want to stay secure, even if one of the clients gets compromised. All right, that's what I wanted to tell about single sign-on. I'm curious if there's any questions. Thank you. <clears throat> any questions? Please walk to the front. I need people to know already how it goes. Throw the first question. Go ahead. Hey. A uh, question about Pixie and why it's actually helpful. If a client can't assure the confidentiality... It's a little bit I'll difficult to understand oh. also because of the music from the outside. Hmm. I can try I'll, I'll, I'll do my best. If a client can't assure the confidentiality of an authorization code grant, what makes it able to assure the confidentiality of a code verifier secret? From your description, it sounds like these are both just static secrets. Right, so you're talking about Pixie writes. Can you repeat the question once more? Yeah, so in the before Pixie, we have a authorization code grant that we receive back and need to protect the confidentiality of that grant for the duration of the lifetime of our application. Mm -hmm. And that's just some static secret that we store. And here we're adding another static secret that we store. Mm -hmm. And it seems like we would need to protect that in the same way. So how does this actually help? And can you, can you repeat what the, what the attack scenario is you're trying to protect against? Well, I guess I'm. I guess I don't see what attack scenario Pixie is trying to protect yeah, against. Yeah. So the, all right. So I understand your question. So the attack scenario is the case in which. So basically, at this point in the protocol, we have an authorization code, and we need to get this back to the user agent some, some, somehow. And in mobile applications. We have um, in mobile applications, we have difficulties getting this back to the correct user agents. So there is quite a risk if you send this code back that this lands up at a, ends up at a, malicious, at a malicious user agent, for example, a wrong, um, a wrong um, yeah, for example, an uh, application installed by the attacker. And what Pixie protects against now is even if the attacker you intercepts this code at this point, it still will not be able to um, continue with the flow because it does not know the code verifier. Because the code verifier is a SHA hash of the code challenge, so the attacker will, will know the code challenge, but it will not know the code verifier, so it will not be able to go on with the protocol after the third step. I see. So it's more about uh, concerns about confidentiality of the link between the user agent and the auth server, and in both cases, yeah. we're assuming the client to be fully trusted? That's correct, yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you for, thank you for the question. Any more questions? Yeah, I see one coming up from the back from the signal, I think. Yeah, yeah. very good. Hello People watching Gmail. online. Yeah, so there was a question. Wouldn't matching the client ID or client secret against the ID for which the token was issued prevent both the relay and the lock-in CSRF attack? Mm -hmm. which is something only the OAuth server, uh, that means identity provider, would have to do. I'm afraid I'm going to have to ask you again to repeat the question because these are quite technical questions which I need to hear twice. Okay. Um, wouldn't matching the client ID or client secret against the ID for which the token was issued prevent both the relay and the login CSRF attack, which is something only the OAuth server identity provider would have to do? I don't think so. This kind of thing is always really tricky. So if I say, yes, you can do this for sure, I'm sure someone is going to implement this and end up quickly. I don't think it's going to work because probably there is still a message that you're going to be able to send to the clients. I think, off the top of my head, that you still will be able to send the same message back to the client because the attacker is still going to know these um, tokens, I think. But this is probably something I would need to write out. Write out. Feel free to, if you're really interested, feel free to drop me, drop me an email and then I can think a little bit longer about it. But probably it's, probably it's not going to work the way you described. 
Yeah, great, because for the people here around, I mean, they can visit you afterwards, but uh, uh, your email address would then be... It's on the first slides. Oh, well, that'll... Oh, no, thank you. Nice presentation. Yeah. Well, thank you. Any final question? No? Yeah, there were quite some tough questions. I, I agree that it's top, difficult to, to top yeah, those. It's really, uh, in general, for security protocols, it's always really, too diffi really difficult to say, I changed a tiny thing. Is it still secure or not? This is really the, the question you really cannot give an answer to straight away. Well, if you have more questions, feel free to ask Matthijs. But first, let me give him a very big hand. Thank you very much. All right, thanks.